Thanks very much. And thank you for being here. Thank you for pronouncing properly the name of my institute. I don't think I could do the name with your birth name. The same with your name. <laughs> All Dutch names are so difficult. So I'm a scientist. I'm, I'm more or less an um, animal in extinction because um, I'm an Italian female scientist. And from what I've heard today, I'm beginning to get a bit worried and maybe I think I should do something else for the rest of my life. And I'm a virologist, so I work with viruses. I spend most of my time actually answering the phone um, and, and trying to find money, but I like to work with um, viruses that, everybody, that nobody else wants to work with. So I'll tell you a story, and this story starts from this, which is we are animals... Uh, from the point of view of a virus, we are animals. They don't care if we have a soul or if we have a more developed brain, or so we think. So most infectious diseases that have threatened mankind come from viruses that were in animals. Some of them have had catastrophic consequences, like the HIV-AIDS pandemic, and others luckily remain confined to um, a smaller groups of infected individuals and do not cause severe pandemics. And you know what? This is not going to stop. So the contact of human beings with animals in different parts of the world is not going to stop because this is linked to hobby, it is linked to culture, it is linked to tradition, and this person that is um, holding that monkey is probably doing his best to um, copy what happened with the HIV pandemic, because the HIV pandemic started out from monkeys, and people were infected through close contact with blood that came from the monkeys. And there's lots of viruses that really enjoy themselves when they go from, uh, when they jump across the species barrier. And this is not going to stop. Because, anybody know what this is? No one? So these are the boats in the sea now. <coughs> and these boats carry um, all sorts of things. They carry goods, they carry food, they carry animals, they carry humans, they carry products. And so um, I promise you they carry legal and illegal products and there is absolutely no way that we are going to stop globalization and pathogens actually um, enjoy globalization and they actually use all the means that globalization offers them to spread around the world. Okay, so um, my story starts many years ago. Um, I, I started working with influenza viruses when nobody was worried about influenza. Everybody thought that this was avian flu. Everybody thought that this was like something that only concerned, you know, a um, few thousand birds around the world. And, and when H5N1, the so-called bird flu, hit the fan, we were one of the few groups in the world who actually knew how to work with a virus and had experience and so on and so forth. And so, so this, this virus, this bird flu virus, originates from birds, and then it is able to spread to a variety of different hosts, crossing the species barrier all the time. And therefore, to understand what is happening um, with the virus, you need to see what is happening as the virus moves in, in different hosts. So as it moves from wild birds to domestic birds, domestic birds to humans, to pigs, and so on and so forth. Oops. Right, so um, what, what put me in the biggest mess that I've ever put myself is in 2006, we were actually working on a project which was funded by the Commission. And um, this project was a project that was developed also to help and support developing countries in the fight against avian flu. And so um, in 2006, Avian flu from Asia spread across central, from the far, the far East, spread across Central Asia and came into Europe. So we were all worried and we're looking at these people in space suits touching ducks with a, with a pole. Um, and then it spread into Africa. 
And this is something that concerned um, the scientific community and concerned a lot of people. It concerned the European Commission that actually put a lot of money into influenza research because it happened in their back garden and wasn't happening in Asia anymore. But still, the presence of the virus in Africa was something which was very, very worrying. And um, my lab was actually the first lab that isolated the H5N1 virus in Africa. And this virus was like really important. We had the eyes of all the scientists working with flu on us because everybody wanted to know what this virus was about and what the sequence was like. And, and so I was phoned by somebody in WHO who said to me, Ilaria, if you give me the sequence of the African virus, I will put it in a password protected database and, and you will be a part of the club. And I said, uh, I said, wait a minute. And then I, I thought about it. And then I consulted. Huh? Think up to ten before you do something. And then I said, no thanks. Um, I said, uh, you know, if, if we're here working against a disease which could wipe out mankind, some part of mankind, which is really dangerous, which is causing lots of problems around the world, I think that the international scientific community should work together and everybody should have access to the sequence. Because who am I with 15 other laboratories to say, no, 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 I'm sorry, you're not working on it because, because you're not part of the club. So, okay, that's what happened, right? And I put myself, as I said before, in the biggest mess of the world. So science came to see us, like, what's all of this about? What is this woman talking about? Like, and science doesn't come very often to an Italian laboratory run by a woman. Um, and, and so this big international debate started out, um, and I ended up on the Wall Street Journal. So I generally don't read the Wall Street Journal because I don't understand it, but I, <laughs> I only get the pictures. And, and I picked it up at the airport because I'd been interviewed by a journalist of, of the Wall Street Journal. I open it, and there's like two pages on me, like this Italian woman who throws the glove at the WHO and says, I'm sorry. Anyway, and the New York Times, and I have three cheers from nature. And anyway, this whole thing blew up and, and became uh, quite a headache for me and my family and my group. Um, but I think that if you, if you believe that what you're doing is right, you have to stick to it. And, and that's what, what we did and what I did. And we convinced... Um, several scientists worldwide to support data sharing. And, and, and now, five years later, we are definitely in a completely different position. Um, what I can say is that the OIE, this is the um, World Organization for Animal Health, now says that it's compulsory. If you are a reference laboratory and you work with these viruses and you receive viruses from wherever around the world, you have to deposit it in, a, in an open environment, publicly accessible database. FAO, which is the agency of the United Nations, which deals with food and agriculture, also supports this. But most importantly, um, the WHO actually came out, this was in 2009, so it, it took WHO a few years, but actually they they acknowledge the benefits of sharing um, and they say it's important to public health that virus sequences are shared broadly so that we can all work together. But this is most importantly what they did. This year they put out a, a, a resolution with, and, and they call it a landmark agreement. So this is something really important for public health in which they say Influenza virus sampled will be shared with partners so that information can be used to respond better for better public health. And they call it a significant victory for public health, and it's been a very long journey. It took them five years, six years, whatever. But now we're there. So we have the commitment from the major organizations that this is something important which should be done. So even if I'm Italian woman, you see? 
So, but why is this so important? And it's, it, it's important, okay, for the fact in itself at the time, right? Because everybody was really worried about bird flu. But it's important because look at the E. coli 0157 crisis in Europe. It took so long before the origin was traced. And as I said, as my first slide said, most pathogens, they either, either have an animal reservoir or a plant reservoir. And so you have to put the archives together. Veterinary uh, scientists and people working with animal viruses have to work together with the people who are working with the human part of the, inf of, of the problem. And similarly, the people who are working with surveillance on feed and on stuff that we all eat. We have to find a way to work together and not to keep the information sitting in a drawer for six years before you remember that you should publish it. And so basically this can become a model for new diseases that are threatening our health. Okay, so I just want to say one thing about how has this impacted research? So, of course, I don't know because I I'm, I'm play around with my viruses and I'm certainly not at the high decision level here, but what I can say is that we are part of a consortium, which is a rather big consortium. It's called Predemics. There's 12 million euros there. And this Predemics consortium, in the call, it said very clearly that it had to foster interdisciplinary collaboration and transparency. So there's vets and, and medical scientists in there. We are developing a sharing platform which will be um, open also to people outside the consortium on the basis of what we have done for influenza because now there's lots of sharing platforms for influenzas. And I, I'm not 100% sure, but maybe 95%, that all publications have to be in open access journals. And this is w the change that I see from, from the, the FP6 to the FP7 projects. And I want to close just with one mention to a friend. Um, Isabel Mingitz Tudela was working for the Commission and she passed away um, last year. She was a, a very strong supporter of interdisciplinary collaboration and she was a very strong supporter of open access and we have dedicated one work package of, of, the, of, of the Predemics project to her memory because um, she has done an awful lot for me personally but also for the people and the scientists who are working in the field of infectious diseases. Thanks very much.